I'm Nick Terzo, and you're listening to The Radical. My guest this week has discovered his own independent course after beginning his career being part of the Hollywood star-making machinery. Industry heavyweights like Republic Records, Dr. Luke, and Scooter Braun were all supportive at the beginning of his nascent music career. His new record, Southern Curiosity, is filled with remarkably authentic lyrics and forges themes much more comfortable to that of an LGBTQ artist. Fancy Haygood joins me this week, and we discuss his initial artist experiences with major record labels, his taking a break to find himself, the right creative collaborators, and most importantly, finding his own voice ringing with its own unique authenticity. This man's voice is stellar, and his new record, Southern Curiosity, encompasses a brand of queer Southern pop like no other. Coming up, my conversation with Fancy Haygood. Fancy, welcome to the show. Thank you for doing this. Oh my gosh, thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. Um, As we were speaking earlier, I was trolling around on Twitter and uh, saw someone had tweeted, retweeted something by you. And I went and listened to your music and I was floored because I had not heard of you. No offense. (laughs) No offense taken. Um, And man, you're a talented man. Thank you so much. That means a lot to me. Well, it's truth. So you've had kind of an interesting career and we'll kind of piece some of this together for people that don't aren't aware of you. You've had some interesting inflection points as an artist, mm-hmm. right? And um, it's, it's been a roller coaster, that's for sure. Yeah, it's curious. So you kind of came to Nashville here as a teen. You decided to get out of Arkansas. Uh, was that because of the LGBTQ thing or was that other things? Yeah. Music? Um, up in Arkansas in like a really conservative um, upbringing. So being as fabulous as I've always been and growing up there was didn't always go hand in hand. And so um, I had a I had a hard time in high school um, with bullying and just all sorts of stuff. So I ended up dropping out of high school and my parents let me drop out, get my GED. And I started college early um, here in Nashville. And my goal at that point was to kind of just get to Nashville to be, start working on my music career. Cause that's always what I've wanted to do. So I went to college for like a semester or two and then peaced out, but it was, it was always my goal to get to Nashville, but I was 17 when I moved here. Wow. That's him. That was uh, bold. And your parents actually supported that. I don't, I think my parents, you know, I grew up Nazarene. And so talking like to them, there's a, um, the Nazarene denomination has a lot of different schools, like colleges and universities. So um, that was kind of my ticket. So I came here with like, you know, not so much talking about my passion for music and wanting to do that, but more so talking about going to a university that aligned with how I grew up. And so I think it was a little bit easier for them to let me do that, knowing I was going to a really conservative Christian school. And also my parents are super supportive of me pretty much with everything. So I, I think they just, they didn't want to see me in pain anymore. And like in the high school situation and um, I got into college, so they just let me go. That's awesome. And so you had a little bit of a bait and switch in your mind though. Yeah. I, I knew what I wanted. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence. I love it. So we have a new record coming out. This is your second record? Yes? No, this is my debut this is th- album. This is really your debut. So it's yes. called Southern Curiosity. Um, and I think the reason I was a little distracted is because I think you had some early uh, deal with like Republic and with mm-hmm. all these big shots like Scooter Braun and Dr. Luke and such. Yeah, you know, pretty much anyone that you can think of that is a big name in LA I've worked with in some capacity. Um, there was a really wild chapter in my life and, um, you know, things happen for a reason. And I learned a lot in that time in my life. I learned a lot of what I don't want. Um, I think a lot of big things happened for me. We put out two singles, um, and they both did fairly well. You know, I had my first single was a top 40 hit. My second one was a 
worldwide viral sensation with Ariana Grande and Megan Trainer. And ultimately, at the end of the day, you know what? And I think this is an age old story of, uh, you know, big dreamer gets to Hollywood, dream like dream comes true. And then, you know, you're just shattered. It's just like the whole thing of like, well, are you a superstar? You don't look like a superstar. And also, even back in, two, this was 2015, I was 24. And the whole subject of me being gay was still such a taboo thing. Even though we had, you know, Sam Smith on the radio, you had Troy Sivan doing his thing. Um, but I've never really been um, into the ambiguous thing. I don't want to sing anything ambiguously at the heart of who I am as an artist. I'm a songwriter. And so I'm a storyteller and I want to tell my stories. I want to tell it how it happened to me. And I'm not trying to sugarcoat it at all for anyone. So um, being in the industry I was in back, back when I was in it, um, it just kind of became a, you know, it was no wonder they called me who is fancy because no one could figure it out. And then, you know, I went through the whole machine of it all. And at the end of it, I didn't know either. So it just wasn't, it wasn't healthy for me creatively. It wasn't healthy for me physically. Um, it became about how I looked and, you know, how, how did people see you and, you know, the LA story, vanity, and that's not who I am. And um, I got lost in it a bit. And at the worst of it, I decided I was coming home for Na to Nashville for Thanksgiving and I ended up just not going back. And so, you know, um, with everything that happened, it was just kind of a, uh, I think people on my team realized I wasn't happy. I think they realized it wasn't going to work um, the way I wanted to do things. And they the way they wanted me to do things were very different and they did right by me. They let me out of all my deals, you know, being in an, people don't know this, but when you sign a, a record deal, which sounds so fucking glamorous, right. And then you sign it. And the next thing you know, you don't have creative rights. You don't have, you don't have any say so. And so they could have held me there for years and years and years. I was, I forget how many albums I owed them, but everyone did right by me. They let me go and let me figure things out on my own. And um, for that, I'm super thankful. I have a lot of gratitude for that because I know a lot of people um, that have been stuck in a, a different situation. And so with that happening, I just moved back to Nashville and started, you know, trying to heal and, figure what it is that made me want to be fancy in the first place and what find that hunger again for creating. And here we are. I mean, we're, it's five years later and, um, I'm older, I'm stronger, I'm smarter, I'm wiser. It's, it's, it was all for the better. And, um, I'm so thankful things did not pan out for me the way I wanted them to pan out for me back in 2015, because there was a lot of things I had to figure out personally for myself. Um, what mattered to me, what was important to me, like when it came to my art, what hills was I going to die on? Um, and I think in finding that side of myself, you know, cause I didn't start writing this, that all happened. I think I walked away from all of that in two, early 2016, like January, 2016. And I didn't start writing for this album until, um, 2018. So it was a it was a slow burn, you know, this this album. It's been a long time coming and I just honestly can't believe we're here and it's, you know, less than 3 weeks away. It's going to be in the world and it's my baby. You know, when I signed my first publishing deal in 2012, I was thinking to myself, this is my year. You know what I mean? And here we are a decade later and I'm fingers crossed hoping that 2021-2022 is my year, a decade later. Um but it's been it's been a journey fully and a lot of highs and a lot of lows and um, it's not been easy, but it's made this moment all so much sweeter because I have fought for this. I have, I have put every part of myself in this. I have stood my ground. I've walked away from really big things um, to tell my story the way I want to tell it. Who did you um, collaborate with on this record? I mean, as far as like a producer or other, do you do all the writing? <clears throat> I, I, I'm a writer on all of all of the songs on this album, but I collaborated with a lot of my friends who are also artists here in Nashville, um, collaborated with a lot of people in London. Um, you know, I wanted to tell a story from a queer perspective from top to bottom. And um, so my experience in the industry, the first go around 
you know, speaking about pronouns and being very honest about what I was singing about. And I'm mostly always singing about boys because what else would I sing about? My other passion is food and, you know, songs about food just don't really go down well. Um, so it was always a conversation. It was always a, well, you can't say that, or we, we need to make it more ambiguous for it to connect or people aren't going to understand it. If you, no one wants to hear that. I mean, how many writers rooms did I sit in being told that my point of view wasn't acceptable? And I don't think people were doing it to be malice. I think we all just know what we know. And, um, that's been the status quo for how long. Um, and that's not what I want to do. So when I started writing this album, it was important to me to write with people that I didn't just know because of the industry. It was important to me to write with people that I knew on a personal note and I've known forever and um, that I know love me and I know that want my story to be told just as much as they want their story to be told. And so I was surrounded by so many incredible artists and the producers on the album are um, Topher Brown and John Green. Topher's here in Nashville. John's out of London. Um, I've known both of them for a better part of a decade, and they're just wizards. I mean, they're both just so talented, artists in their own rights. And um, as far as songwriting goes, I got to collaborate with a lot of amazing artists. Audra May um, is someone, an artist who I met out in L.A., and she's an incredible songwriter, an incredible artist. Um, and her and I wrote a lot for this album. And then two of my friends named John and Jacob, they're in a band called The Brummies. Um, from Birmingham, but they're out of they're out of Nashville as well. We've collaborated a lot. A friend of mine named um, David Borne and I wrote a song on there. And then I also write a lot by myself. So there's two songs on the album that are um, just me. Right. What's now? What I heard on Apple Music, I couldn't get clear if I was listening to uh, the former tracks or where we're going. There was obviously Southern Curiosities. That's the name of the record. I assume that's on the record. Yes, that's the yes. that's that just got released. That's the newest song we put out. Awesome. And then Thank Mr. You. Atlanta, where was that from? Um, yes. Mr. Atlanta past. Yeah, this is from this record. Um, so anything from the past will say who is fancy. And there's only okay, two songs. It. So got in the last year, I've released quadruple amount of music than I have in the past. Got it. Which is okay. You know, a great feeling because when you're an artist and you're creating all the time, you just want to be putting music out. And the fact that I only ever had two songs in this world for so long was such a weird thing, but that's not the, the case same anymore. Thing is, the same thing is beautiful. Thank um, you. The lyrics on Mr. Atlanta are like incredible. I mean, it was really nice to like see your own experience in there and being able to speak it from like a gay man, you know, and put those lyrics there. And so I was Bro I wrote Mr. Atlanta in London with a friend of mine named Ben Mark, um, who I met through my producer, John Green. And, it, you know, creating in London is just so interesting because I feel like a lot of like the um, conversation about being gay or queer, like when I was saying those lyrics, Ben didn't look at me one way or the other. It was just like, fuck, yeah, this is awesome. Like, you should tell that story. Like, let's do it. And then, you know, melodically and all that stuff, it's so fun. It's like, at the end of the day, who fucking cares what I'm singing about? It's, it's a fun song. And I think whether you're gay or straight, you can relate to that journey of like dating and it just not panning out, you know? It's just kind of a... I don't know. Those three songs are pretty impressive. Your vocal performance is incredible. And uh, lyrically, you are quite a writer. Thank you. That's clear. I appreciate that. It's very clear. Um, so, I mean, have you done touring in the past? Have you not had that opportunity because of the machinations of your past arrangements, so to speak? Um, I did tour a little bit back in 2015. I opened for Ariana Grande um, on her honeymoon tour, which was an amazing experience. Ariana's always been so kind to me and um, her whole crew and every, it was just, it was a, to be honest, for that to be my first tour, I was just kind of like super spoiled. Um, coincidentally i was supposed to go on tour with megan trainer and it, it got canceled um because of uh, I forget, a medical thing with her vocal cords um so the whole tour got postponed and then by the time it came back i was no longer uh, in business with all the people i was in business with so um yeah i haven't had an opportunity at this point to tour any of this new music so 
that's definitely on the forefront of as the vaccines get rolled out and people can start congregating again. I cannot wait to perform this album live because, you know, people know me as a songwriter, but my whole life I've been a performer. I like I, I feel like the stage is my true home and that's where I love to be. I love to perform. I love to entertain. Um, so I, I honestly. I mean, I'm just going to be an emotional wreck when I finally can be in front of a crowd. Oh, it's all pent up. It's all going to come out. So, <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to do. I'm going to do backflips or something. I don't know how yet, but I'm going to do it. So you sometimes I've seen the music referred to as kind of like a queer southern pop. Are you okay with that? I mean, is that the I, 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 I coined, description? Is that I your coined coined? that term? Yeah, and you know what? My whole time in LA, every A and R person I sat in front of, you know, was so just condescending and like, well, you don't really have a sound. What's your sound? You know, we need to find your sound. And that drove me fucking crazy because it's like all these songs, I'm writing all these songs. Why don't you tell me what the fuck my sound is? You know what I mean? It's like, if these are all coming from me, how is this not my sound? And, you know, I think everyone's just trying to like find something that is an immediate, like no one believes in a slow burn anymore. No one believes in an artist like taking their time. Everyone's looking for that ambulance chaser, surefire hit. And you know what? I had one of those and look where it got me it's just kind of like i'm looking at this this point i'm kind of looking for i want a career you know i want longevity i want to i don't want to tell my story right now and that be that i want to continue these stories i want i want the chance to be able to just like fully be myself and whatever that sound is it's just kind of so when i came back to nashville it was really important to me to be every single part of who i am in this music and in LA, it was like, you're too twangy. You sound like Nashville. This is, is this country? Um, you're in, you're a Nashville songwriter. And th- you know, that was being said to me as if it was like a negative thing where in a, you know, in Nashville at that point, I, I wouldn't really consider it like super, um, open-minded then I feel differently now, but, um, you know, then they're like, oh, well you're pop because heaven forbid a gay man, you know, sing a country song or sound country so i i felt lost in this like you know i just felt unaccepted so finding a team of people that wanted to allow me to create my own music without any a and r's without any managers without any label speaking into my creative process um that is how this whole album was born and so when people started asking me about it i was like this album is queer this album is southern and this album is pop because pop just means popular and i think these songs can definitely relate on a a, on a larger spectrum than just country than just top 40 radio i just feel like honesty is what people are looking for authenticity and i put my whole self into this album and i told stories that are true i mean like everything that i say in this album is a real thing nothing's fabricated so it's just kind of like um, I coined that term because I was tired of people asking me what my sound was. I just wanted to put this album out and that just be, people know what they're getting the second they hear it, you know? Yeah, they can, uh, record companies can definitely scramble an artist um, and kind of dissemble their uh, compass, so to speak, right? Um, and I've been in those rooms before where you just can't, I don't know. You just can't direct it. I mean, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying. Yeah, I think I can honestly say, I think, I think (laughs) it is a trip. I mean, anyone telling someone who's not creative, telling someone who is creative, how to do anything is just very interesting. That would be like me calling my manager and telling them how to do business. It's like, I don't fucking know. That's why I'm not a manager. You know what I mean? It's like, that's why I write songs. So it's just one of those things. I think, Looking back, I probably wouldn't have said this like four years ago, but looking back now, I think it was all well-intentioned. And I think everyone wanted um, me to have a big opportunity and and the best shot. But when you're this openly queer and not willing to settle on um, ambiguity, I think that fear is what leads the decision-making. And I'm tired of operating in fear. I'm not scared of who I am. I don't think that the majority of America is scared of who I am. I think people are dying for new content. I think people want to hear stories that haven't been told yet. 
And I can't think of a better way to expose people to our community than just being straight up honest and telling them how I feel, telling them how we feel and not saying I'm speaking for everyone, but the best messages I get um, from these songs coming out the last couple of months are people saying, I never thought I would hear my song on a country format. I never thought, I never thought I would, wouldn't have to reach to a female artist to kind of, and that's what I set out to do in 2015. And that's what I feel like I'm finally having the opportunity to do now. And it just feels as well-intentioned as everyone was back then. I feel like I'm finally doing what I set out to do on my own personal uh, merit. And that just feels good. That just feels, despite what happens with this record, despite like where it lands or, you know, what I feel like I got to do what I wanted to do. And that feels good. Good for you. I mean, I, you know, look, I find it shocking that, you know, here we are where we are in this time and age and, you know, I understand these conversations 25 years ago. You know, I was at Columbia Records. We had Ricky Martin. We had you mm-hmm. know, George Michael suing us over, you know, some of the homophobia. You know, it was a weird time for an artist as a gay man. Um, but to hear that that 25 years later is still a discussion, it's just mind-blowing to me. Like, really? I mean, listen, yeah. I mean, look how many discussions as a country we're having to have. Like, right. there's so many things that are just so backwards. And I think, I use the word well-intentioned because I don't think people intentionally wanted to be homophobic or say things that made me feel less than, but inevitably when you're not supporting someone and who they are 100%, you are being a little homophobic. If you're not supporting a person of color (laughs) being who they are, you're being a racist. It's like, these are just another thing that came up all the time was my weight, how I look. Um, the second I moved to LA, I was put with a trainer and I worked out six days a week until I was, I guess, skinny enough to be seen. I don't know what the whole thing was, but looking back, um, I can, I can honestly say I played a part in all of that. I believed them when they spoke negatively about me. I, you know, had my own internalized homophobia about what I did and didn't want to do. And I think I've had the opportunity to to learn and grow and educate myself and become a proud gay male. And um, I think through time, people are going to have that opportunity too. And so I try to be a little bit less like, that's why I say, I think everything was well-intentioned. I don't think anyone set out to truly hurt me or damage me or make me feel less than um, inevitably. That's just what happened. So um, I'm hoping that all of those people learned from it the same way I did. You know, I'm hoping that it was an educational moment for A&R people, for management, for label heads. I hope I hope people can take that as a learning uh, learning moment because that's what I took it as, and it's not something I'm ever going to do again. <laughs> good for you, good for you. Self respect, my friend. It's all good, and I'm sorry that the you know. But this is the battle of all of us in the gay community. This body image thing is just so destructive in the gay community, uh, for gay men especially. Mm-hmm. You know? Listen, um, I think that's another thing I, I, in my music I want to speak to because the most, uh, you know, I talk about my experience with, you know, L.A. and the label system and stuff like that. But the most criticism I have faced in my career, in my personal life, is from other gay men. And... I no longer want to be a part of that. I no longer want to be someone who can't support other gay people. Um, And I I have been that person in the past because, you know, for so long you're told there's only one seat, (laughs) you know, like how long was I in LA being told, well, you know, Sam Smith's doing this. So, and then, you know, I don't even know Sam Smith and it starts making me feel like, well, you know, I can't support him because if he's doing this then that's, there's no room for me. And what I learned immediately after leaving LA is that if I believe that there's only one seat for us as gay men at the table, I've already given up my chair. And the thing is, is there's room for all of us. It's just true because even as gay people, we all tell different stories. We all have different experiences. And I think it's just too important to, 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 to share our stories, to like say how we feel, to share that narrative that's never been discussed because I'm not Sam Smith. I'm fancy. I'm not Troy Sivan. I'm fancy. Troy Sivan's not me. He's Troy. 
you know? And it's just like the fact that people can't get that in their head, but it's something that I had to learn to like stop competing with people that aren't my competition. We all have our own lanes. Gay people aren't just one thing. And, and I think that's what, I think the word gay just like so pigeonholes us. But I, again, I'm not afraid of my sexuality. I'm not afraid of your sexuality. So therefore, why am I competing? Why do, why am I allowing other people to pit me against people that I should be supporting? Because their win is my win, you know? And as, as deep as we get into this industry and as successful as other gay men can become, that's more opportunity for other gay men to step up and have an even bigger reach, you know? So it's, it's just a learning curve for me. Um, and I'm just like happy to be creating music where I'm creating music now, because back then this couldn't have happened. Good for you. That's a good attitude. Um, I think we're all still learning as they say <laughs> nowadays. And I tell people that, you know, people always say, as you get older, you get more set. It's like, you know what, the older I get, everything in the world becomes less set. So I don't understand where that ever came from. It's so yeah. weird. Everything's gray to me, not black and white anymore. It's a weird oh. thing going on. So 100%. You know, I grew up in a space where everything was black and white. It's either good or bad, you know? And um, I think coming out of the closet at a young age kind of like shook me away from that of like, is it all that? I don't know. Because, you know, when you get into like the details of, why the people I grew up with think being gay is bad. You're kind of like, well, there's so many other things that should be bad then from like where you're pulling all of this from, which is usually like biblical stuff. But I don't know. I'm just the, the older I get, the further along in my life I get, the more I'm just interested in supporting other people, being myself and trying to find happiness in like the mundane, you know, because it just gets exhausting if you're not doing that, you know? Yes. Nope, nope, nope. Energy going all the wrong places. So <laughs> yeah, agreed. Agreed. So tell me what, um, do you play? Um, is there an instrument of choice for you or? Yeah, I would say that this album was mostly written around a piano. I think it was pretty, um, heavily piano driven. Um, there, the, I play guitar, I play piano. I'm self-taught on both. I would never say like, I'm a guitar player. It's not like, it's not like I'm going to show up at the Grammys and like shred on a, you know, guest spot on someone else's song. Um, but I, I know enough to write my songs on both. Um, I love them both equally. And I go through phases where, you know, this album, I was definitely more piano inspired. I was inspired by like Elton John and like that, you know, glam piano rock. That's kind of what I was inspired by. I'm also inspired by like church music gospel music and you know pianos and organs and all of that are so heavy in that you know area so that's kind of where southern curiosity and all the songs on it kind of formed but you know as i'm creating now i'm definitely more into my acoustic guitar and having like a that kind of moment so that's where i'm at creatively now so it just really depends cool how many songs on this record i think there's 11 songs on this album Awesome. I can't wait to hear the whole thing. Um, yeah. One last question I wanted to ask you, is there a career out there that you think you would like to emulate? I mean, you're a young artist, you know, this is your first full record. Um, who out there do you really think, wow, that's a career that I would love to have? <laughs> um, I love Elton John. I love been my entire life. I've known who Elton John is. You know what I mean? And that's so funny thinking back to like growing up the way I did and like it being so conservative and whatever, but Elton John is just like, I mean, like he entered into my life via the Lion King, you know? And so I just think not just a musical talent, which he is a, you know, obviously the most brilliant, but he's, he's an icon. He's a part of culture in so many different ways, fashion, movies, music. Um, and that's something I kind of would love to have. But even more so, there's also, I mean, Adele is someone who I've idolized since I was, when did her first album come out? I think it's, has it been 10 years now? Yeah. I mean, for the last decade. I think, yeah. Um, for the last decade, I've loved her. I mean, she's everything to me as a songwriter, as a performer. I love her humor. I love how she uses that in between her, like, serious songs that really appeals to me. So she's another one. But um, also, as of lately, I just love, 
um, artists who are like genre bending. Um, so like Casey Musgraves, I love her last album, Golden Hour. And I, so I just, yeah. And I just love where, um, I feel like where she sits in pop culture because, you know, it's not this like Uber celebrity where, you know, she can't go to Walmart if she doesn't want to. I mean, obviously she probably definitely gets bothered, but it, you know, it's not this like Britney Spears level of fame where you just can't live. I want to be able to live my life. I want to be able to experience stuff because I think that's where my songs come from is my life experience. And I always want to be able to like relate in that regard. And I think Casey does that really beautifully, um, being able to relate to the everyday person. Cool. How did the UK connection happen for you then that you kind of plugged into that? Um, Well, I'm signed to a a publishing company called Downtown Music Publishing, and they've been just giant champions for me. Um, They really made me feel like I've been able to revive my career. The first people, uh, my publisher, Steve Marklin, and ironically, one of my best friends in the entire world, her name is Natalie Osborne. She's my publisher too. And um, it's just a whole different thing. You know, this, this whole starting from getting signed there and then wanting to help me with this record and put that into motion. It's just been, um, but they're a global company. They're, in, they're independent, but they're global. So they, they've been, I mean, they, they've sent me everywhere to like, just try to figure this out. In London, I have a friend named Lucy Silvis, who's a, was a huge artist over there. She's an amazing artist here in Nashville and her albums have just been so meaningful to me and she's a dear friend. And so I was able to connect with a lot of people via her because she's from London and um, John Green and her grew up together. So John Green produced my album. So, and I sang on Lucy's album that he produced. So it's just, it's all in the family. You know what I mean? That's awesome. I was trying to connect the dots from Bentonville to Nashville to, to, to the UK. So. Nancy's global, baby. You can't keep me. Nancy, can't keep, you are. Can't keep me no, in the natural state. No keeping you down, my friend. So <laughs> um, this record is, is, I can't wait to hear the rest of it. Uh, you're so talented and uh, this is your moment and you're going to do really well and you've paid your dues. Um, You know, you got your head hit around a little bit by, you know, some of the people in this business and uh, (laughs) that's sometimes what it takes to surmount, uh, you know, go through the wall and win. So. Yeah. Well, um, like Elton John said, the bitch is back. Bitch is back. Congratulations on this record. Everyone needs to listen to this record. It's fantastic. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for doing this, my friend. Stay healthy. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening this week. To follow what's going on with this podcast, you can go to theradicalpod.com. Theradicalpod.com. You'll find show notes and past episodes and uh, even a little swag there if you want a T-shirt or a hat. I would be honored if you'd subscribe at Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Until next week. 